Hello, everyone. Welcome to ITS 140. So today we are going to continue with our, our discussion of um, files. Okay, so if you remember, that's the topic that we started last week. And today we're just going to continue with it. So I'm going to go ahead and load up the slides in a sec here. All right, so uh, just a few reminders. Uh, so if you remember last week, I asked you to form groups of uh, three, no more, no less. And then to start thinking about some topics that you want to um, you want to implement. So I already gave an idea of what I, you know, what, what is required for the term project. So if you haven't done so already, please one person in your group send me the uh, send me the, you know, the team members and then three ideas of, of things that you're thinking about doing. Okay, so if you haven't done it already, just have one person in your group, send me that information uh, so that I can take a look at it. And then we can discuss, you know, remember that the semester we have about, um, you know, what, a uh, few weeks left, five, six weeks. So you really want to start working on, on, on all of this as soon as possible, okay? All right, are there any questions before I get started? Any questions? All right, so then uh, let me share my screen here. So, so today we're going to go over, uh, continue with the slides, just kind of going to review them a little bit just to see where we left off. Let me share. And then there's some questions. You cannot do so. I'm getting some questions. Um, if you can do a project alone. You cannot, right? So one of the things that you have to do in the course is, uh, you know, deal with teamwork. And so um, you need to work with somebody on this, okay? All right, so you should be seeing my slides here, I believe, um, right? You should be seeing the files, Python slides. And I think I've covered these already. So we are just going to kind of review these. Um, so please let me know if, if, it's, it's, if you're not seeing the slides. All right, so if you remember, we were talking about, um, we talked about input validation last week. So that topic is done and I'm not gonna discuss it anymore. And instead, we're just going to focus on files today. So you can see that here. Okay, we're going to focus on files. All right, um, so we already went over this. All right, so introduction to file input and output. Uh, we talked a little bit about this. You know, we talked about how files are, and today we're probably going to get into a little bit of the coding of files. Uh, but it's basically the idea is for a program to retain data between times it is run. So you have to save the data. All right. Um, so the terminology is going to be like input file, output file, reading and writing. All right. Those are going to be the, the terms. And then we went over this. Uh, we'll talk about the process. Usually you open a file, you process the file, and then you close the file. So we'll talk about that. 
Um, we talked about this. We talked about how you can have text files and binary files. Uh, in Python, I mentioned that binary files, there's the pickle module. And at, at some point you'll come across this. It's an efficient way of saving objects directly as a data structure in a binary way. Um, or you can save your files as text files. So we'll pretty much do that. Just, you know, this will focus on this. Um, and then our approach will be to look at the data sequentially. Uh, so the file name extensions that appear at the end of the file name, usually we're going to use the extension .txt. I, I just, you know, it, it just, it's intuitive to use that. Um, okay, we talked about that. We've talked about this. Then we went over this. I'm pretty sure I went over this, but I'll repeat it today as we start defining the code, uh, the, the path and location. And then the functions, you know, notice here, read and write, right? And then there's also read lines. So, you know, we'll explore those methodologies. And, you know, uh, Python is an object-oriented programming language. So whenever you create a file, create an event hand, uh, you know, a file handler, basically, and then that object has properties and methods associated with it. Okay, uh, so we'll talk about this, the, the new line character. So anything that you read, usually whenever you have an enter in your um, text file, it'll be represented as this symbol. So you'll see that when we read it sometimes, we're going to have that symbol. And then we're going to, after we do this, we'll probably look at uh, processing strings next week. And so you'll see how we'll start to get into, into those ideas. Uh, so the read method is the, file, is the file object method that reads entire file contents into memory. So it literally will take everything in the file and just read it as a string. So we'll, we'll try that out. It only works if file has been opened for reading and the contents are returned as a string. And as I said, next week we will explore how strings um, actually work. Okay. The read line method is a file object method that reads a line from the file. So it basically, you know, it's like you can think of it as reading line by line, right? So it reads a line, then another line. Uh, and the line is also returned as a string, including the, this is called the new line character. but you can also call it the enter character, right? So, you know, it basically means whenever you press enter, that's going to be stored in there for you. Uh, the read position marks the location of the next item to be read from the file. And that's, you know, usually Python will take care of that for you. Uh, you don't have to really uh, worry about it. concatenating a new line to a, and stripping it from a string. So as I said, this is more in line with uh, handling strings, which is the next chapter. Um, but here, you know, as we read files, in most cases, data items written to a file are values referenced by variables. Usually it's, it'll be necessary for us to manually, since we can't press the, the uh, enter, in the code, instead, we're going to have to kind of concatenate this to our string so that the, the new line character is there. So it's usually necessary to concatenate um, the new line character to data before writing it. And this is carried out by the plus operator, which remember between two strings, it concatenates the strings. All right, and, and, and within the, the right or right line method. 
In many cases, uh, you may need to remove the new line character from the string after it is read from a file. And there are several methods. There's rstrip. Uh, I like to use replace, but it just, you know, it's a preference. Okay. Appending data to an existing file. So whenever you want to create something, uh, so whenever you want to create, a, let's say a log file. So this is appending is usually good. You know, you have a log file over time and you just want to record uh, things in it. Um, over and not delete the previous contents, you know, you're going to open files with the append flag instead of the right flag. Because whenever you use the right flag, it'll just replace everything. So when open file with W mode, if the file already exists, it is overwritten. To append data to a file, you use the A mode, which stands for append. If file exists, it is not erased. And if it does not exist, it is created. Data is written to the file at the end of the current contents. <laughs> okay. Any questions so far, guys? All right, no questions. Uh, writing and reading numeric data. Numbers must be converted to strings so that, you know, that's pretty much similar to when we use input. Uh, so, you know, same idea. So numbers must be converted to strings before they are written to a file. The string function converts values to string. You know that, familiar with that. The number, uh, numbers are read from a text file as strings, and you know that as well. And then they must be converted to numeric type in order to perform mathematical operations. Otherwise, if you did something like plus, they'll be treated as strings and they'll be concatenated instead of added. Um, and you know the functions to use int and float functions to convert string to numeric value, basically. Using loops to process files. So we'll be using loops um, here since we're going to, you know, basically read maybe sentences and then start processing them. So one of the things, one of the first things we'll do, um, you know, in the examples this week is, you know, we're gonna iterate through some, um, through, through some lines in a text file. And that's a, you know, that's something you, you, you kind of have to do. It's pretty standard. Uh, so files typically use used to hold large amounts of data. The loop typically involved in reading from and writing to a file. Often the number of items stored in, in file is unknown. And so the read line method uses an empty string as a sentinel when end of file is reached. You can write a while loop with the condition while line not equal to empty. And there, there's actually various methods that we can follow for this. Okay. All right, and you can see here the flow chart of it. Uh, as we do problems, uh, either today or, or on Thursday, we are going to, um, you know, look at at the flow chart as well, but it, you know, it's pretty straightforward. If you, if you notice, the only difference is that now you have this symbol, um, open the file, right? So you have that basically. And then after that, uh, we use still the input symbol, use read line to read the first line of the file. Then is it, a, is it an empty string? We have like a conditional here because it's a, you know, it, this implies a loop, right? If it, if it is, then, you know, close the file, basically. If not, you know, we're going to process it somehow. Process the item that was just read from the file, and then you use read line again to read the next line from the file. And that's it. You know, it's a pretty straightforward uh, approach.
Any questions? Okay. So the for loop to read lines, uh, Python allows the programmer to write a for loop that automatically reads lines in a file and stops when end of file is reached. You know, and here we have the format for line in file object, right? And usually this file object, uh, as you might imagine, is some type of a list. And so to, to get that list, we'll, we'll use some function like, you know, file dot read lines. Um, and that will give us the list that we can iterate through. And then the loop iterates once over each line in the file. Processing records, you know, at, in the beginning, that's pretty much what we're going to, you know, text files usually have data in them. So we're going to refer to text files as things that have uh, data sets or they have other, another name for data sets might be records, right? So they have uh, special records uh, of the information we're storing. So if we have a, like a shop, Right, a pet shop, then we keep track of the information of all the pets in there and so on. So a record is a set of data that describes one single item. So usually every row represents either a sample or an item and it's, you know, a record, it's a row. Like imagine text files are very much like Excel spreadsheets. If you've used Excel spreadsheets, so the rows indicate the samples or the records and the columns indicate the field. So for instance, it might be that you have, you know, a student, right? So each, each row is a, you know, student. So then you have student um, ID, right? And that's one column separated, let's say by comma. And then you have, um, you know, first name, last name, you know, course, and so on, grade, let's say, you know, dot, dot, dot. So that's the way that we want to store them. Fields are single piece of data within a record. So these are the fields, right? Or the columns in an Excel spreadsheet, right? And so for each student, you have a value in there. So write record to sequential access file by writing the fields one after the other. Okay, so they're going to be, you know, uh, done that way. Um, and then you read the record from sequential access file by reading each field until record is complete. Usually we're just going to read the whole line. That's usually the best approach to read everything, uh, you know, all the lines. Okay, um, so, you know, and you read it until it's complete. So when working with records, like text files, it is also important to be able to add records, display records, search for a specific record, modify records, delete records. So usually what you do in, in, this, in this approach is, let's say you have a text file dot txt and then you have your you know your program log and the program accesses the file so what you're going to do is you're not doing all these operations on the text file per se um, if it's a small enough file what you probably want to do is load the file into memory so you're going to load the entire file into ram do all the processing in ram and then write it back to the text file. That's probably the best approach. If you have such a large uh, set of records, right, such a large set of records that reading things into memory all at once doesn't make sense, then that, you know, that requires something like a database, you know, an actual like MySQL type of a database or some other distributed type of an approach where you have, you can have many 
text files, not just one. But you know, that's outside of the scope of this class. I mean, you're, you'll cover this in, in a lot of detail in, in other classes. Uh, exceptions that we already handled, right? Uh, exceptions, error that occurs while a program is running. Now, in this in this example, though, we're not going to talk about exceptions like input validation. That's I already covered that in another set of slides. In this case, I'm going to cover um, another type of an exception. And if we go over here, there it is. So it's called a try catch usually. In Python, it's called a try except. So we'll take a look at that one. All right, so the try except is a structure in Python that kind of works like this. And as, as you might notice here in, in the implications of the name, you do something like, you, you tell Python, try this. So for instance, you're gonna say f dot read something, right? If that f.read fails, right? Now, let's say that we're writing this code in the Jupyter Notebook, for instance, and we've seen what it looks like when the program errors out. So we know what that looks like. So let's say that it does error out. So if it errors out, usually all we have learned so far this semester is that when something errors out, the program crashes. But you don't, you don't always want it to crash. I mean, it's, it's, it's a legitimate thing that you could sometimes in a, in a huge data set where you have a million records or something like that, that some of the, er some of the records might error out for whatever reason. And that's okay. It's acceptable because you keep track of how many times it errored out. So if it's only going to error out five times out of a million, you know, that's an acceptable thing and you don't have to have the program crash. You can just let it continue. So what the try catch function does is that it's going to try, as the name implies, the F read. If it fails, it, instead of crashing, it's gonna do whatever you tell it to do here. So that might be log an error, increment a counter, et cetera, but it doesn't, the program does not crash and it just continues and goes back and then it executes the next try, right? So, so that's a very, very useful and very powerful structure. And you know, we'll see examples of that one as well uh, this week. So let's provide uh, some type of a formal definition. So the exception, uh, error that occurs while a program is running. So the exception is an error that occurs um, while a program is running, usually causes program to abru abruptly halt. A traceback is an error message that gives information regarding line numbers that cause the exception. So you can see here, this except actually has a built-in method that you can say something like E and then by definition, the event that trigger the error will be recorded in E. So you can always then, or you know, it could be, you know, error. There's a few of these. And so now if you want to see, because you're debugging, you're trying to figure out what happened, you can actually print out that error. And you can say print error, and it might give you additional information as to what the problem actually was. Okay. It indicates the type of exception and a brief description of the error that caused exception to be raised. Okay, so that's, you know, pretty important there. Okay. So many exceptions can be prevented by careful coding, such as input validation. We already did that, right? I showed you guys how that works. But this is an additional element that you have that is very, built in in Python, and it's extremely useful uh, to use. 
It usually uh, involves a simple decision contract. Some exceptions, then there are some exceptions that cannot be avoided by careful coding. You know, ex examples of that, trying to convert non-numeric string to an integer, trying to open for reading a file that does not exist, et cetera. So I think the, be the best example is like when you have, like, like I said, some data and you know, it's a data, especially when something is like live in real time and you're collecting the data and you know, you just, you, you never expected that input, right? So you're gonna end up with unexpected behavior, but it's a rare thing. So what you do is you kind of just catch it with the, the try accept, log it so you can analyze it later on. So the exception handler here uh, is the code now that responds when exceptions are raised and prevents the program from crashing. In Python, in Python, uh, it, it is written as a try accept, which is what I had said, it's the try accept statement. Notice the general format is to use the keyword try, use a colon, then you have the accept, you have whatever exception name you want there, also a colon, and then here you can have as many statements as you want, as long as they are indented, Oops. as long as they are indented here, you know, remember our convention for spaces, um, that should be good enough. The try suite, uh, that's the statement that can potentially raise an exception. So that's the code that you want to like enclose within the try to make sure that it doesn't error out. And then the handler is the statement, uh, the accept statements contained in the accept block of what it is that you want to do. So that's where you would log, you would, you know, correct something, you would print out something, etc. Any questions so far? All right. The if statement in, in the try suite raises the exception. So the, the, this if statement is kind of implied. So it's not really like you write an if statement. All right, so, um, so the handler immediately following an accept, you know, a, a, an error, uh, it'll execute the accept. And then the program just continues uh, after the try accept statements have been run. <coughs> okay. So, um, So in the accept, sometimes you can have multiple errors. Uh, so that can happen. It's not uh, extremely common, but it can happen. And then, as I said, you have several errors to handle those, so several objects that can catch different kinds of errors. So you can always print out more than one. So it might, let's just say you have like try, ex, you know, something, except, and then let's just say E1, E2, three and then you can print those as well to get more information about what happened all right all right and here we have for instance displaying an exceptions default error message so now we can look at the exception object it's the object created in memory when an exception is thrown. So as I said, if there's an event in the, while the program is running that cr creates an error, um, the default error message will be saved there. 
can assign the exception object to a variable in an accept clause, for example, accept value error as error. And then you can pass the exception object variable to a print statement function to display what the error message actually said. So you would do something like print, you know, directly below, print error. Uh, so the try except statement may also include an optional else clause, which appears after all the except clauses. It should be aligned with try and accept clauses, the syntax similar to else clause in decision structure. And so this will be a block of statements executed after the statement in try suite only if no exceptions were raised. Usually though, people just use the try and the accept. Um, so that's usually what will happen. The finally clause, try accept statement may include an optional finally clause as well, which appears after all the accept clauses. Uh, and it's aligned with try and accept clauses. The general format is finally and then statements are pretty similar. Um, so it's a block of statements after the finally clause. It's the same thing, just, you know, indented. And it's just the last one. It, it, this will execute whether an exception occurs or not. The purpose is to perform cleanup before exiting. You could do this outside of the, the try, so rarely used as well, but it's there. And I'm sure it's got some efficiencies. Um, I just honestly, I haven't seen that a lot um, in any programs, but it's there. Now, what if an exception is not handled? So uh, no except clause specifying exception of the right type. So, you know, so, you know, computers can have unexpected behavior and the exception is raised outside a try suite. In both cases, exception will cause the program to halt. Um, so, you know, that's just, usually the try, the try except is pretty good. So I, you know, I would, I would fully expect that I mean, I'm sure there's a possibility, but if you use a try except, it'll handle most of the errors. So your program will pretty consistently run without halting. All right, and uh, that's basically these slides. Okay. All right, so now let's, are, were there any questions about any of this? All right, it doesn't seem like there's any questions. So let's go ahead and move to the other slides. Just to kind of for completion, I wanna make sure I've covered everything before we start working through the actual code. So as you know, these are a little bit repetitive, so I just wanna make sure I've covered every, every little detail. Um, We've talked about all of this. You know, we've talked about what we use text files for. Um, you know, basically for our purposes, like spreadsheets, we're gonna use them for records. Um, you, could you could keep track of scores for a game, you know, you know who's got the highest score, uh, things like that. Um, and so on. Obviously, text files are used by many programs, browsers, etc. But for our purposes, we're just going to focus on small applications. We've talked about this, talked about this, talked about that. So 
So here, the, the important thing, I guess, that's a little bit different is that the pseudocode, right? So in the homework, you're going to have to write pseudocode. And this gives you a little bit of an idea of how to write it. So you have to create an internal name that is similar to the variable name. So for instance, you're going to declare an output file called customer file. Output file indicates the mode in which the file will be used. So that the, it's the file handler and customer file is the internal name used to work with the file. So it's the actual thing that you're going to reference in your code. Uh, so here, the pseudo code, if you want to open the file after you've declared it, you do open customer file and then the name of the file with the extension. Notice that it is placed in double quotes to indicate that it's not a, this is not a reserved word, like a variable name, but instead it's a string. So this is a string usually. And then data can then be written to a file. So you can say something like write customer file, right? Um, remember that you reference the event handler, not the name of the file itself. Okay, so that's an important distinction there. So you say write customer file and you write to it this. Or you could say declare a string name, Charles Pace, and then write um, to customer file the variable name. Either way is fine. And then always you want to make sure that you close your files. So you close customer file and again you close the handler, not the name of the file. In the in the in like in the file system. Uh, delimiters and end of file markers. So a delimiter is a predefined character or a set of characters that marks the end of a piece of data. So for instance, I did the example of a comma separated file, right? So I have you know, A comma B, one, two, three, and then you have B comma A, one, four, three. So those are delimiters, right? And, you know, and this, this would be the type of a CSV but there are other delimiters. There's actually the tab control, and that's just a key. The tab is on the uh, upper left-hand corner of your keyboard, just says tab, and it's a symbol that sometimes you put in, you know, you have, you know, uh, A, and then you're gonna have this symbol, which implies tab, and then B. So that's the equivalent of A comma B, except that you're separating things by tab versus separating things by comma. Okay. So that's what a delimiter is, a symbol. It separates the different items stored in a file. And then a file will have an end of file EOF marker. That's a special character or a set of characters written to end, you know, like a null character in C to indicate end of file. Okay, and so in C in particular, you have that. In Python, that's abstracted, um, so you don't really have to worry about it. And then here we just have the pseudo, the basic pseudocode for reading data from a file. Uh, so you declare variables, so you'll say declare input file, inventory file, so input file indicates the mode in which the file will be used. So, you know, read. And then inventory file is the internal name used to work with the file, the handler. Then you have the file can be open. So you do open inventory file, which, you know, this one, right? It's that one, which is this one, right? So open inventory file and you give it the name, which is a string, right? And then you do, uh, then you read it. So you have read inventory file, and then you read the item name. And then finally, don't forget 
to close the file. So notice how you're always referencing that file handler, okay? That's really the thing that allows you to control the file in a lot of detail. Questions? All right. The append mode, as I stated in the previous one, usually when you don't want to overwrite a file, right? So we've talked about this. Uh, the important thing here, the pseudocode. So you declare an output file with append mode, which in Python would be just an A, right? And then, you know, my file for your handler. And that's basically basically it. So now let's take a look at how to write the pseudocode for uh, using loops to process a file. So here we can see uh, this will be different in pseudocode versus Python. It's meant to be a little bit more, this pseudocode is meant to be more general, so it applies to multiple programming languages, not just Python. So here we can see uh, loops can be used to enter large amounts of data. Okay, large amounts of data. And basically you can think of this as having a counter, so you can say for counter from one to number of days, uh, so you display enter sales for the day. So you enter, right? And you have the counter for the day, then you input the sales and that's your data. And now you're gonna write that to a file. So you say, this assumes already that you've opened the file, write the sales file and what do you write? You write sales, which is the thing that you just read, okay? So you're writing to a text file. If you wanted to read just until the end of the file, you would do something well, not end of file sales file, right? So basically what it's happening here is you're keeping track of where you are in the file. When you get to the end of the file, it stops. So that's why you would say, while not in the file sales file, you're going to read. So you read sales file, you read, uh, into sales file, you read sales. And then you can also display, you know, once you've read it, right, you can, you can uh, display it because you've got it from the text file. So we'll do that. This classic example, we'll do that in Python, but just be aware, you know, this is sort of the approach you have to follow for the pseudocode. As long as you have the logic, I really, you know, doesn't really matter how you do it, but just make sure you get the logic correct. Files, using files and arrays, so as, as you might imagine, files are kind of like arrays, but in a text file, so an array will have data, right? And a text file, so this is an array, and a text file has lines, right, rows. So really, each row could go in an array, Right, so that's a possibility. And so it makes sense to think of arrays or lists in Python. And in fact, that's probably the first thing that I will do is just, I'm just gonna use the read lines function of a file handler. And basically the read lines function just loads all the sentences into a list, which is you know technically like an array. You can take the contents of an array uh, and save it to a file. So you basically open the file and then you use a loop to step through each element in the array and then you write the contents to a file on each iteration. Now, Python has a lot of libraries actually, you know, many, many libraries. We're not gonna see them here in this class. It's outside of the scope of the class, but just be aware that there's a lot of ways to read and write uh, to text files. You know, in particular, you want to be efficient about it because that can be slow sometimes.
And then the other way, the other thing um, can apply, you can read the contents of a file into an array. So that's the same thing. You open the file, use a loop to read each item from the file and store each item in an array cell. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at that. Okay, any questions so far? Questions? All right, so let's keep going then. Okay, so um, the processing records, we've talked about that. The data is stored in a file, it is frequently organized in records. A record is a complete set of data about, about an item, like a row, and a field is a single piece of data within that record. So that's just, you know, think of Excel, right? So Excel, each row is a sample or a record, each column is a field, a feature, right? And it just indicates something. So, you know, the example I gave you of students, so student one, student two, student three, they all have the same fields, name, for, you know, first name, last name, grade, et cetera. Writing a record is done using a single write statement. So you can see that here. We can say write to employee file name ID number department. So in pseudocode, that's how we can do it. If we want to read, it's sort of the same. We say read employee file name, as you can see, and then we say name, ID, and so on. So it, similar idea. And then we've talked about this as well. So we've talked about that. Control break logic, that's, those are just interrupts, interrupt, interrupts a program. Uh, it, it interrupts its regular processing to perform a different action when a control variable value changes or the variable acquires a specific value. One example is the use of a line counter to pause the program before the information being displayed goes out of view. This can be done with some kind of an if statement. Um, and it's just, you know, some logic that you can add um, to keep a, a counter of how many lines you've read and at, at which point you want to stop or, or not display information anymore. All right, and here's an example of it. If lines equal 24, then display, press enter, any key to continue, input, and you reset the line. So it's, you know, this is just, if you want to, pause maybe when you're looking at your data. Pretty simple, really. All right, um, so that is it as far as the slides. Okay, so now what we're going to do is I'm just going to do an, you know, an example of, you know, doing this in Python. Let's go ahead and open up our Jupyter Notebooks. So um, I'm going to open Jupyter. And I'm going to navigate to the to a folder here. So we need to open that folder. All right. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to share this folder first. I'm going to do share. So you should 
I think you should be seeing the folder. Is that what you're seeing, the folder? Well, yeah. All right, so in this folder, I'm going to right click here in the white area and I'm going to do new and then I'm going to do text document. You can see that there. All right, I'm going to keep the extension .txt, but I'm going to uh, give it a name. Okay, so the name will be, um, you know, let's call this, you know, um, chapter, uh, not chapter, let's say files. Right, files, example. Oops. Files, example.txt. So remember that name. If you don't see uh, extensions, if you're on your Windows environment and you're looking at these files and they don't have exception, uh, extensions, what you have to do is in the file explorer, Go to the, look at the, you can see that I'm hovering over at the top menu where it says home, share, click on view. And then if you notice over here, there's going to be a file name extensions. So if, if you're not seeing the, the extensions, this is not checked. So you can see that, All right? So just go ahead and uh, click on it. I'm going to click on it again, and you can see that the extensions reappear. And I usually like to keep the extensions there. Uh, it's more helpful to me. So that's what I would recommend that you do. All right. Okay, so now I've created this file, but it's currently empty, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on it and I'm going to open it with, you know, WordPad, for instance, or some editor. Okay, so now I have this, right? If it's, um, if the, the screen is not showing like this, you can also go to view and where it says word wrap, if you probably, you might have it like no wrap, right? Um, so just change it to wrap to window. And it'll, it should look the way that I have it. All right, so now I want to add records in here, right? So I'm going to say uh, just a simple one, you know, Monday, Tuesday. Notice that I'm pressing enter every time I do this, and that's adding actually an invisible new line character. So if I Hello? do. Excuse me. Wait, wait. I'm, I'm stuck. I only see a Jupiter screen. Okay, so that's why I asked you guys if you were seeing the folder. And you guys said yes. Um, all right, I'm going to start again. Okay. Right. Are, you, are you seeing the folder now? Yeah. All right. So I'll repeat all of this. Um, I'm going to create a file. New. Text document. All right. I'm going to call it file. One. Okay. File one dot txt. If you're not seeing. Um, Gonna get rid of these. If you're not seeing the extensions, you have to go to view. And then you see this file name extensions, just check it. Okay. Then after that, the file is currently empty. So we want to add some data in it. So I'm going to right click on it and I'm going to do open with WordPad. And you'll see that I have WordPad on here. If you want Word Wrap, you can go to View and just click on uh, Wrap to Window. Okay. 
I think it's either me or you, but for me, it's kind of frozen. I don't know if that's just me, like your screen. Okay. It's still on the file explorer. File explorer. Okay, so... Now you're moving. I see the mouse moving now, but it's still on file explorer. Can you see the text file now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So again, I open the text file. So if you want to view as word wrap, you'd click here, wrap to window. All right. So now this is the text file. So let's just do a simple example of adding some words in here. So I'm going to say Monday, hit enter, move down. Tuesday, new line, Wednesday. Now, I want you to understand that every time that I'm typing or hitting the enter, an invisible character like that appears, which is a backslash N, but you're not going to see it, although it's there. Okay, just be aware of that. And then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. All right, so that's basically our simple file. We have those four days for now. So I'm going to do save. So I'm saving the file. Remember the name is called file1.txt. Remember, I'm showing the You should be seeing the file explorer and the file is called file1.txt. You can see the extension. You can see a 1KB of data. It has some data now. So now we're going to go back to the Jupyter Notebook. All right. So you should be seeing the Jupyter Notebook now. And I'm going to go ahead and create a new file. You can see the file is there file one and now i'm going to say new python 3 and now you should be seeing the jupyter notebook environment where we can type our code so what do i need the name of the file so i don't forget is file1.txt notice that the name has to be put in double quotes because it's a string if the file, now currently I put the file in the same place where this script is located. So they're both in the same folder. However, if I had put this file, let's say on the desktop, right, then I would have to put in the full path, you know, like you would do like home user, you know, in Linux or something, you specify the entire path so you can find the file. However, here, I'm just putting the file in the same current, what is called the current working directory. So that's where it's uh, located. Make sense? Yep. Okay. So now, uh, what I need to do is I need to create a file handler. So I, usually, you just use the letter F, and you can say F, you know, whatever. Uh, you want to call it F, you know, my data, let's say. My data, something like that. And then uh, you need to open the object. So what you do is you use the reserve word open. And you can see that there. And then you do that. So you open file1.txt, which is currently located in the working directory, current working directory. All right, and so now 
we can add here comma and we have to add the mode. So here we have three options, read, write, and append. Those are the three main ones. There's a few other combinations. By default, read will be the one shown. Here I can add a comment just to sort of remind you, read, write, or append. Okay. Oops, and I'm missing a double quote there. And that's it. That's how you basically create the file handler for the text file. The next step is to read the data from that file and you're going to um, now iterate. Let's say all we want to do is iterate through that file and print the contents. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a for loop. So I'm going to say for line in. Now I reference F my data. And then notice here, I'm going to do something. I'm going to actually do dot, oops, read lines. And that's a method. And what this does is that this is equivalent to creating a list, right? So we just do it directly in the for loop. We create the list uh, and then we're going to iterate through it, right? So we're going to call f my data dot read lines. <coughs> and then we just iterate through it, through this. <laughs> so I'm going to add the colon here and now I'm going to go ahead here and I'm just going to do print line. You see that? And that's it. With this simple little code, I can iterate through the file and print the content. So let's go ahead and run this. Oh, and then I have a typo there. Okay, let's try it again. And there you go. You have all the characters in there. You guys see that? Yeah. Any questions? Any questions? All right. So now the line actually has the new line character. So if I wanted to get rid of the new line character, I could do line dot replace. And I can specify that I'm looking for new characters and then I want that replaced with just nothing. Okay, so notice that it, it finds, whenever it finds this, it replaces it with nothing. And so we reassign that value to line. So I'm gonna try that. And you can see that now the words are kind of more together because what was creating the effect of the words being so spaced out was that it was double printing. So it, whenever you do print, it actually has a, an enter at the end, plus it had this enter from the file, so it was doing both. By doing this, I'm actually now, I've actually now gotten rid of that new line character and all I have to do, all I have is the data. So you usually wanna get rid of it so that you only deal with the actual word and not, you know, like a new line character. Now, don't forget, I, you know, once you finish this, you want to do f my data dot close. So you open it, but you also want to close it. Make sense? You can see that there. Now I opened it and I closed it. Now what I wanna do is I'm going to write to it, right? So I'm gonna do the same thing again. Just gonna copy this. Paste it down here. Okay. 
Uh, but I'm going to try other things. So this time I'm just going to say uh, beta equal f my beta dot read. Let's just see what happens. And then I'm going to say print data. So, you know, that's pretty much the same thing. I open the file again as read. I'm going to close it. But in between, instead of the read lines, I'm just going to take f my data read and I'm going to print data. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and try that one. And you can see that it pretty much does the same thing. It reads the data uh, with the new line characters and everything. Now, let's say that I want to try taking the data and running it through replace new line character with nothing. So let's see what happens here. So I'm going to Okay, so now I'm going to try this. What happened now? What do you guys notice? It's all on one line. It's all on one line. So I got rid of the new line characters that we're creating the spacing, the enter. And so now I have everything as one single string, okay? One single string. Any questions? Any questions? All right, so now I'm going to create another one. I'm gonna say F out. So I've been reading, now I'm going to write, so I'm going to say open, I'm going to try to open another file, file2.txt, okay? And I'm going to say now I want to write, so therefore I do w instead of read, okay? I'm going to close it. Okay. I'm going to close it here. And now I'm going to try to write. So I'm going to take, first of all, the file does not exist, right? I just created it. So we're going to see how that works. Um, I'm going to take that string data and I'm just going to try to, but I'm going to say data equals data, which is a string. And I'm going to concatenate to it uh, 2020. Okay, and I could also concatenate it at the beginning. So I'm just gonna say 2020. Don't forget the plus sign over here. So I, you know, I'm just adding a modification to the string. And then now I'm gonna try to do F out dot write and remember the file doesn't currently exist and i'm going to try to read uh, to write to it okay so that's basically the idea so i'm going to go over here okay so let's run it Okay, so I don't see any errors. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to the file explorer. So I'm gonna share. Hmm. File explorer, so you should be seeing the file explorer now. All right, and you can see there's a file too. So I'm gonna open that. WordPad. Now I need to share that. Thing. Do you guys see the string in there? 
Yeah. Right. And you see that I added the 2020 at the beginning and the 2020 at the end. So I was able now to write to a text file. Okay. And remember, the file didn't actually exist originally. So I was able to um, create it on the fly, really. So really, you just need a file to exist beforehand when you're reading, obviously. But if you're writing, if the file doesn't exist with write, you're just going to create it, okay? Questions? All right, so let's go back to the Jupyter Notebook. Now be seeing the Jupyter Notebook again. All right, so we've been reading and writing. Um, so let's try, let's try something a little bit more interesting than this. So let's say um, I just want to, I have the following. So you're going to create now like a message. So you're every, every iteration, you're recording some data. So you're going to say, you know what? I want to do the following. I'm going to do, uh, no. break line, let's say. And break line will just be, so let me just, let me just think about what we're going to, let's say we want to print out some output, right? We want to print out some output. You know, we're processing some data and then we get a result. Like, let's say that we're doing translation. We have an algorithm that does uh, English to Spanish translation, something like that. And so every iteration we want to record the output. So we want to print out something that looks kind of like a break line would be, you know, something like this, like that. Okay, and then we want to show, um, let's say we have, um, you know, we have a number, an ID, the English real sentence, the real Spanish sentence, and then the predicted. So we have a whole bunch of variables that we need to piece together, okay? And we want it also to look, you know, like presentable. So we have break lines here. We have ID, you know, ID string. you know, just some number. And then we have, you know, sentence one. And then you have that. And then you have sentence two and you have that. Okay. And so you, you kind of want, want all of that to be written like that. Okay, and then you have um, but you're also going to write, you're going to write, need, this is going to change every iteration. So that means you're adding to the file. So you probably, instead of using W now, you're going to use a pen. So you're going to write to the file at the end. So, so now you want to keep things. And so we're going to need some kind of a for loop now. So I'm going to say for I in range. And then let's just say I'm going to repeat this, you know, 20 times. 
<laughs> Hold on. So now um, I want to put all of that together and just make one single write to speed things up. So I'm going to say F out. I got data, but I need to now merge all of this, including that I together, right? So, and then all of it will be in a variable called all data. So I need to add to all data, all this information. I need to concatenate all of these. Because I want the new line characters, I'm gonna have to add those at the end. So I'm gonna say N here, ID string, double quote, N, and sentence, also, n, and then over here, so that it all appears nicely formatted, I'm going to have to do all of these. So I'm, I'm adding like the enter signs at the end of all of these. Okay, and then I need to concatenate these. So what I'm going to say is, all the, and this one also now needs to have the new line character. All right, so what I'm gonna say now is, and I actually want three break lines to appear together. So I'm gonna take all data, all data, and I'm gonna add break line plus which is concatenation, break line plus break line, right? That's three lines. And then concatenate ID string. And then concatenate sentence one. And then concatenate sentence two, all right, and that should give me all data, but then still I need to concatenate the I because the I is going to be um, the, let's say, iteration. So I'm going to create a string called iteration that's going to be a string iteration plus, and then I'm going to take my I, I need to typecast it to string, and I'm going to add that at the beginning also with a new line character. All right, so now that I have that, I'm going to put that in front of all data. So I'm going to say all data is iteration concatenated with all data. And hopefully I think this will do it. I'll be able to write all of that string in one single write. And so file two, um, and actually I'm gonna try file three this time. So I just create a new one, all right? So Let's see what happens. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and run everything. So I'm gonna do you know, that one, that one, everything works. Now let's see what happens here. Okay, there's an error. It doesn't like something. Break line is not defined. Oh. So I used underscores. Let's get rid of that. Try it again. Okay, so I'm gonna try it one more time. Okay, another error. Name data is not defined. Okay. 
Oh, it's because I didn't run, run the previous one. So let me do that. And that one. Now I need to generate data. So I got it. And then now I'm going to run the next one. And this time it didn't error out. So then I'm going to go ahead and share the file explorer. So you guys should be seeing the file explorer. If you notice file, I, so let me know if you're not seeing the file explorer, but you should be seeing file3.txt highlighted. It's 7 KB in size, which means I added 15 entries. So now let's see what it looks like. I'm going to open it with a uh, word pad over here. And I'm going to go ahead and share that file with you. And there it is. There it is. So it's not exactly how I wanted it, actually. Um, it's confusing. You can see there's some problems with it. But it's sort of doing so a lot. So it's working. The mechanics of it are working. The logic that I used is obviously wrong. So I'm going to change that a little bit. It's, it's appending the iterations at the end. And that's not at all what I wanted. So let's see. But I think I know how to fix that. So let's go ahead and go back to the Jupyter Notebook. All right, so what's happening here is that it's keeping the data, right? In, in, the, in the for loop, I need to clear out um, I need to, I want to, so I want to keep, so I actually, there's a, there's a few things here that, I, you know, I want to keep, let's say, ID string. I want to keep that one. Uh, so I want to just have those three. Then in here, every iteration, I get the iteration and the and the iteration ID. So it's really here that I want to use a different variable. Um, whenever I let's let's just try modified data. Let's create that. Modified data. It's going to be blank. Okay, so I'm not going to use all data. Instead, it's mod data. And I want break lines first. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a variable three break lines. And it'll just be break line concatenated with break line concatenated with break line. Okay. So then over here, I want the break lines to be the very first thing. So it's just going to be three. Oh, it shouldn't start with a number. Yeah. So, uh, so three break lines break lines okay and then after that i want iteration which is there okay and then after that i would append the data which is all data id sentence one sentence two Then I write it. Next iteration, mod data is once again blank, which is what I want. And once again, I add the three break lines. 
iteration, the current iteration, which is what I want, and old data. So I think this will work, hopefully. So let's go ahead and try this again. Now, because it's an append, I need to, I want to empty out the file. So it was an append. And so I don't want to continue adding to it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to delete file three and I'm going to create it again. Okay. Are there any questions so far guys? All right, so let's run this. I'm do run, okay. Generate my data, there it is. And now I'm gonna, you, you should be seeing the Jupyter Notebook. I think you are. All right, and now I'm gonna run this third one. Okay, it ran. Seems like I'm gonna share now the file explorer. There it is. File three. Now it doesn't have a lot of data, so that's something strange. Open file three, okay. So something didn't work. Uh, I'm gonna share the file now. So as you can see, now it, um, It didn't add the ID and it didn't add the break lines, right? Do you guys see that? How come? All right, so, that, so that's actually strange. I concatenated three break lines and then I'm somehow it takes iteration, it takes old data. It only takes old data actually. Huh. Any ideas why this is not working? Is it because with the break line, you have break line equals, uh, and then at the very end of the, like, quotes, you have slash n, but the other three you have plus slash n. Oh, yeah, that's a good observation, but it, it would be the same. It would be the same because I'm just concatenating. So I could have done, I see what you're saying. It's a good, um, <laughs> definitely a good observation. I wasn't consistent there. Both of those things are the same. So this, so this I find this really strange that it's not working because I'm doing break line, concatenate break line, concatenate break line, three break lines. And then I'm putting the three break lines. Oh, okay. You know what? It's a, it's a simple error. Look what I did. Oh, it should be my data. <laughs> yeah, it should be my data. Okay. So that makes more sense. I was <laughs> getting a little worried there. All right. So that should fix it. Um, so what I'm going to do again is I'm going to delete that file, file three. Delete file three, okay. And now I'm going to yet again run this. So you should be seeing the Jupyter Notebook. Let's go to the top. All right, run this one, generate the data, got the data. Now run it, okay, it ran, no problem. So now I can uh, go to the file explorer. So that's gonna be 
file explorer here. Mm. It's got 5 KB now, and if you're seeing the file explorer, so now I'm going to show you the file. And now you can see it kind of looks like what I wanted. I want it every, every time I add a record in there, I want it to separate things with these, uh, with these, right? So I know that, you know, what I'm, what I'm looking for is really the data inside. Okay. And I've got my, let's say the code or whatever, the two sentences in there. And then I'm keeping track of the iteration. So I have iteration zero, one, two, iteration three, iteration four, five, six, you know, all the way, you know, to 19, because it starts at zero, right? So it starts at zero. So that way it goes up to 19, but it's 20 entries. And you can see there, then I got all my data in there. Iteration, dot, 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 dot you know, all of that. Does this make sense, guys? Yeah. So the reason why I did it like that is that I'm not sure, but I think, let me go back to the Jupyter Notebook. If you go, so you should be looking at the Jupyter Notebook. I think having just one write versus doing a whole bunch of writes, um, it might be faster, you know, to just do that one write instead of, Right, right, right. Because every time you write, you're writing to the, the, you know, the hard drive or the SSD. And maybe that's equally fast, but it's good to know, right? So the other alternative for you would have been, you know, F out dot write uh, break line, F out dot write other break line, F out dot write third break line. F out dot write iteration, F out uh, dot write old data. So you would have ended up with five writes in there, which is fine, uh, but it might be a little bit more cumbersome code, more, you know, slower. So this one um, is just one write, and then you just piece together the entire string. Two approaches there. What I would recommend that you guys is that sometimes you try one approach, sometimes you try the other approach, okay? And, and just see how it goes. Also, always don't forget to close the file, okay? And that's basically it. So if you can see today, uh, very simply, we practice um, reading from a file. You can see that there. In particular, we read the files. We use the read lines. Uh, we also started to look at strings. So next week, we'll start looking at strings in a little bit more detail. Um, and so this is kind of an introduction to that. So you'll probably see this again next week, the replace function. Then in the second one, uh, we here we uh, read as well, but in another way, right? We just use read instead of read lines. And then in the third one, we used, uh, we did both write and then I modified it to be a pen so that I could add things. So for instance, uh, just for completion, let's say that, remember that it went up to 20, right? So now I'm going to uh, do from 20 comma 40, okay? That file already exists. The file already exists. I opened it, I closed it. Now I'm just gonna try to append another 20 records, but to continue 20 to 40. So I'm gonna go ahead and clear. The file is, you know, and now I'm gonna re reopen the file and I'm gonna append to it again. So we're gonna try to anyway. So I generate the data, got my data, and now I'm gonna run this. All right, it ran, no issues. So now I'm gonna go to the file explorer again. I'm gonna share my screen. 
And now if you look at file three in my file explorer, if you notice the KB used to be five KB, now it is nine KB. So now I'm gonna open it, right? And I'm gonna open it. So I'm gonna share the screen yet again. Okay. So it starts at zero, zero, 19. And notice now that this is where it had ended before. And now guess what? I got more records. I got from 20 to 39, because 20 to 39 is 20. And you can see I didn't overwrite the old contents. In fact, the old contents was still there. I just appended the new set of records to the end of the file. Is this clear, guys? Yeah, I was. All right, that's it. That's it for today. Make sure that you uh, practice this code. You know, I would strongly recommend that you just go over, watch the video again, write this code on your own. It's not homework, but just practice this. If you weren't following, if you weren't typing along, uh, and then on Thursday, as you might expect, I'm going to start going through some problems from the book, the PDF and we'll solve some of those during the session. All right, that's it for today. And I will see you guys um, on Thursday. A couple of reminders. One, the project. Don't forget what I said about the project. And then number two, um, start thinking that you'll have a second exam on week 12. Uh, check the calendar. I updated the calendar a little bit the course website calendar so that you can see some important dates coming up as we approach the holidays and also the end of the semester. All right. All right. So we're going to stop here for today and I will see you guys on Thursday.